If you've plateaued on your weight loss journey with Hashimoto's and you're wondering, can gut health or inflammation contribute to weight gain and the difficulty in losing weight or weight loss resistance, this episode is for you. Today I have on Dr. Alexis Cowan, a Princeton-trained PhD specializing in the metabolic effects of nutritional interventions. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher at UPenn developing novel patient tumor imaging technologies and studying the interplay between microbiome and various disease states. She also sees clients as a health and performance optimization consultant. I'm Dr. Emily Kybird. I'm a chiropractor and movement expert. I too have Hashimoto's, but currently in remission. And I am the founder of Thyroid Strong, currently helping women learn how to work out without the burnout. If you're interested in dipping your toes into what a Thyroid Strong workout or approach looks like, I am introducing the Thyroid Revolution. It's starting May 15th. Sign up now. We're going to do five Thyroid Strong style workouts so you can experience how it's different from maybe a challenge or a boot camp that you've done in the past. And it's going to teach you techniques that will last a lifetime on how to work out so that you don't burn out, how to work out so that you can jumpstart the weight loss process, as well as a two-part masterclass on weight loss resistance with Hashimoto's and how to get over that. If you're interested, go to dremilykyber.com forward slash rev, rev for revolution, super easy, especially for us brain foggy Hashi ladies, dremilykyber.com forward slash rev. There is no obligation to sign up. It is free. If you join, you will get so much benefit. It's kind of a mix of a challenge meets a masterclass. It starts in a couple weeks, May 15th. I hope to see you there. Now let's dive in with Dr. Alexis. Dr. Alexis Cowan, welcome to Thyroid Strong Podcast. Super excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I'm really excited. I think we'll have a great conversation. I did some research this morning and I did some research a couple weeks ago and you actually had some gut issues from when you were a kid from antibiotic use. Is that true? Yeah. So, I mean, the gut issues didn't really become manifest until I would say my early 20s. But mm. a- after like reflecting on my health journey, um, you can really see like the, everything falling into place to just like create a, a storm of, of a mess in, with regards to gut health for me. Um, so what happened basically, long story short, or maybe long story long, is first grade, I had recurring strep throat. Um, I would be pulled out of school like every couple weeks because it just kept coming back. And so I was on antibiotics for the better part of a year, probably at least eight months, I would say. Um, And so my mom got really frustrated about needing me to like keep coming out of school. So she ended up homeschooling me for second grade. And during that year that I was away from my peers, um, my weight really started kind of spiral to the point where when I went back to third grade, I weighed about double my classmates. And uh, now, of course, there's pretty strong science showing that early antibiotic use can really contribute to childhood obesity. So it's not a big surprise. But back, you know, in the 90s when this I was born in 1992, so I would have been um, around it would have been around year 2000, I guess. Uh, We didn't really have that information at that point to know how harmful antibiotics were could be for the metabolism, for the microbiome. The microbiome was really only just beginning to become part of the conversation around that time. And even that didn't really start to really pick up within the scientific community until like maybe 2010. So anyway, third grade, I'm heavier than all my classmates. And from that point onward, my weight really began to continue spiraling to the point where junior year of high school, I was around 270 pounds. And like, in addition to just being like very unhappy and uncomfortable in my body, I would also get sick very frequently, like upper respiratory infections, skin infections. I had terrible acne just like not having a good time. Um, Having said that, I also did have a a great childhood in a lot of ways with, you know, different activities and art and music and great friends. So like, it's not all gloom and doom, but from a health standpoint, it was, I was really in bad shape. And so what ended up happening is I was basically like enough is enough. Um, I signed up for the gym that was near my house um, and essentially committed to just really giving it my all to try to lose the weight. And so I went to the gym every day for a year straight. I would do an hour of cardio every day. I would do 30 minutes to an hour of strength training every day. And in addition to that, I started tracking my food. And um, at this point, I was really eating mostly processed food because 
you know, it's easier to track calories when there's a label on the package. You don't have to weigh and measure stuff as as rigorously. So I wasn't at the point yet where I was considering food quality. I was strictly thinking about food quantity, counting calories, um, like 1500 calories a day um, for for that year and really hitting the gym. And I, over the course of that year, I lost about 85, 90 pounds or so. And then in the year following that, I would say I lost probably another 10 ish pounds. So like in total, I've lost about 100 pounds. Um, and also towards the end of that year, I really started getting into CrossFit, which introduced me to powerlifting and like really like serious strength training, which was ends up ending up being a huge passion for me to this day. Um, <clears throat> CrossFit has its problems, I think, but ultimately it was great for me to introduce me to that world. Um, and really, you know, kind of incite some passion and show me what my body was capable of. And that was really important for me too. And I think it was also a very important aspect of me being able to keep the weight all when I'm thinking about this in retrospect, having that weight training and the resistance training program, um, really helps to maintain basal metabolic rate in the face of weight loss, um, and help to maintain muscle in the face of a caloric deficit. So we know now this is super important for maintaining weight loss and and helping to prevent that weight regain that's so common for people. Um, but so after the weight loss, excuse me, <clears throat> I experienced quite a bit of gut issues that was kind of secondary to an eating disorder that I not so surprisingly developed during that weight loss period, becoming you know very strict with the calories and really thinking food in, in a quantitative way is not healthy, particularly for my mindset. I think I can just become very... Um, wrapped up and obsessed with things. And so for me, particularly, counting calories ended up in a, with a pretty serious eating disorder that lasted I, on the better part of maybe five years, um, specifically bulimia, which obviously terrible for the gut, terrible for the digestive tract in general. It's very stressful. Um, but so basically that kind of prefaced the whole IBS situation that started developing around my early 20s as well. Um, and so I ended up going to a doctor. I had blood in my stool. I had a bunch of mucus in my stool. I couldn't eat anything without getting intense bloating, gassiness. Like it was just miserable. And the doctors, you know, they, they're basically like, you're young, it'll probably go away by itself. Also, I feel like IBS wasn't really in the conversation at this point either. It's become more increasingly popular to discuss and as a diagnosis. But at that time, it was like, you know, we do have some like potential immunotherapies or anti inflammatories that you could try taking. But I personally have always kind of been somewhat distrustful of mainstream medicine and don't really like reaching for pharmaceuticals or relying on drugs to kind of alleviate symptoms. I've, I've always been more so the mindset of I want to know actually what's going on and target it at the root. And I think this largely stems from me just having so many health issues as a child and seeing that the medical system continually fail me because, you know, the issues kept coming back. So I ended up kind of doing my own investigation to try to figure out what was going on. Um, also important to note at this time, I was getting my bachelor's in biochemistry uh, in my undergraduate degree at Moravian College. Uh, prior to that, I was actually in culinary school, but ended up pivoting into science, um, kind of a whole other story into itself. But um, the point being that I was already kind of science minded and I've always been a very curious person and somebody who wants to understand things, especially when it's coming to my own health. But just in general, I'm like really curious about how the body works, you know, about the nature of reality, et cetera. So this was something that, you know, was very personal to me, obviously, because I wanted to alleviate my symptoms. But I was also just fairly curious to kind of know what was going on and what may have caused it. So I started reading about elimination diets and like the potential of the diet actually impacting gastrointestinal health. Like what a, a crazy idea. And so I ended up doing an elimination diet and finding that dairy was a major trigger for me. And I cut it out for the better part of about four years, very strictly, not even butter, like nothing. And I noticed almost immediately when I cut out dairy that all of my symptoms went away and I had relief for the first time in years, which was an absolute godsend. And so this was really the first point in my health journey where I recognized the power that diet and food has to impact and shape the way that we feel and also the way that we look and even the way that our minds work, our psychologies. And so at this point, I really started shifting more into a food quality mindset. And this was super helpful for me from 
the eating disorder perspective too, because I noticed that once I started prioritizing whole foods that were, you know, not processed, not coming out of a box, that I was cooking myself more, that I was really engaging in that process of vetting the sources of my food and then also participating in the cooking process of that food, that my appetite would naturally regulate itself. Um, and I wouldn't feel guilty around eating because after you know losing that amount of weight, there's of course a fear that that weight could come back. And a lot of that stems from, you know, just not actually having a relationship with your body and understanding your, your hunger signals. And a lot of that can also get hijacked if you're eating a lot of processed foods because they're, they're essentially hijacking the parts of your brain that say eat more. Um, you're not satisfied, like continue consuming. But when you're eating, you know, especially a protein forward diet that's really prioritizing whole foods, um, your appetite will start to naturally regulate. And it's actually easier for you to say, you know, I'm full now, like I don't need any more. I'm good. Um, so that was absolutely crucial for me with regards to like the psychological eating disorder component. And it really sent me down this journey of like really understanding the food system, trying to um, put the pieces together with regards to how food quality impacts our biochemistry, our metabolism. And ultimately, that kind of drove me into the PhD program that I, that I picked, though it was kind of not planned per se. So I ended up choosing Princeton because it was close to where I lived. And, you know, I figured Princeton's grade school, I'm sure I can find something there. I, so I applied, interviewed, um, got accepted. And I, even at that point, I didn't have an idea of what lab I would choose. And so there's rotations at the beginning of the PhD program for a lot of science programs. So I rotated in three different labs, actually hated my first two rotations. And I was really, really stressed going into my third that I would have to leave because I wouldn't find a place. But my third rotation ended up being like a perfect fit and funnily enough, I hadn't even considered doing research on diet or exercise or anything related to this. Um, I kind of, they were kind of separate in my mind, but then this lab really pulled everything together. Um, it was the Rabinowitz lab at Princeton. And so it's a metabolism lab. And I ended up studying um, metabolism in the context of exercise and diets and fasting, um, particularly ketogenic diet. And so these kind of this program really pulled the pieces together for me and allowed me to realize that I could actually make a career out of my passions. And ultimately, that's led me where I am today. So I graduated and I started my own practice where I can help other people and support other people on their own health journeys um, and be that person that I wish that I had on my own. I think some key takeaways. First of all, antibiotic use when you're a kid can 100 percent affect gut health, gut dysbiosis, because I think a lot of women who are struggling with weight loss or inflammation or bloating or irregular bowel movements, they're not thinking that. They're not thinking, mm -hmm. oh, when I was a kid, you know, I'm, I'm the daughter of a pharmacist. So it was always like Cipro for everything if I had a cough or no matter what. And so I think that's like a very important point for women to think about. I think the second thing that's really important and interesting is, you know, weight loss is one of the biggest struggles with Hashimoto's. And calories 100% matter, but they're not the only thing that matters. I'd love for you to share with the listeners, what role does our microbiome play in terms of the management of inflammatory conditions? Great question. So just briefly with regards to like calories in, calories out, and that model of, of weight loss slash obesity, um, it's true that calories matter. But the problem is that both sides of the equation, calories in and calories out, are pretty hard to quantify. So calories in, and this kind of ties into your question with regards to the microbiome as well, calories in aren't just the calories that are going into our mouths. It's also the calories that we absorb um, in our guts. And so this can vary quite a bit by the person. And particularly, there's a, a species or a group of bacteria in the gut called acromantia. And these bacteria live within the mucus layer of the gut, and they're really crucial for establishing um, healthy gut permeability. And essentially what that means is if you have less acromantia, your gut tends to be hyperpermeable, so you're absorbing more calories from your food. And in addition to absorbing more calories, quote unquote, you're also absorbing more endotoxins and other molecules that shouldn't be coming through the gut lining into the bloodstream that can trigger off inflammation. One example would be like LPS, which is... Uh, essentially uh, an endotoxin expressed by certain bacteria within the gut that is typically there, but it's not typically absorbed unless the gut is hyperpermeable in this like quote unquote leaky gut um, state. So individuals, it's very uh, well established and repeatedly observed that individuals with higher levels of acromantia 
tend to be leaner and have better glucose control. And that even in rodent models, and I think this is kind of developing into humans as well, in rodent models, if we basically give obese mice uh, acromancia via a fecal matter transplant or even a probiotic, that they can actually improve their body weight, lose fat, and also improve their, their glycemia and their glucose control. And so we know that acromancia plays a super important role for the calories inside of that equation. In addition to that, the calories inside of the equation is also uh, contributed to by our satiety, like how full and satisfied we feel by meals. And that's largely a gut brain axis uh, oriented or gut brain axis controlled phenomenon. So there's specific molecules called incretins that are secreted by our enteroendocrine cells in the small intestine. And these molecules will essentially signal to the brain when it's time to stop eating. Or conversely, it will, they will also signal to keep eating. So ghrelin is one example of a hormone that's essentially going to drive appetite versus um, things like GLP-1, which is super popular these days because there's these GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic that are basically hijacking this part of the gut-brain axis to trick our bodies into thinking that they're full. Um, but essentially, the, we, we know there's a relationship now between the microbiome and the, the secretion of these different factors that can control appetite and satiety. And so ultimately, a successful weight loss strategy needs to kind of consider our ability to feel satisfied for a meal. It's not a long-term solution to just deprive yourself and be hungry all the time. Like in the short term, yeah, you can use that to lose weight, but ultimately your your willpower will falter at some point and you're going to continue eating at a, an ad libitum rate. Um, so we really need to consider a long-term strategy if we're trying to have successful and permanent weight loss. And then with regards to the calories outside of the equation, this is a very, very complex um, myriad of different factors contributing to this. So Actually, interestingly, the microbiome is considered a major thermogenic biomass within the body, and antibiotic use actually will decrease resting metabolic rate a non-trivial amount, probably somewhere between 2 and 5%, which, of course, adds up over time if we're considering, you know, this calories in, calories out model. And then in addition to that, we have energy expenditure from activity, which is pretty hard to estimate. It's going to vary a lot based on somebody's lean mass to fat mass ratio. It's going to vary a lot based on intensity, um, heart rate, and like heart rate monitors kind of are, are using heart rate as an estimator to kind of kind of determine how many calories you're burning during activity, but it's pretty inaccurate. It's just giving you kind of a ballpark. Could really be higher or lower than that, depending on your personal metabolic rate, your body mass, and like your body composition. Um, and then in addition to that, we have our basal metabolic rate, which is controlled by all the processes that our body needs to conduct at rest. Um, in order to just keep us alive. So that obviously consumes energy. And then our muscle mass just at rest also can contribute to our basal metabolic rate, um, a non-trivial amount. And so leaner individuals uh, who have a higher proportion of lean mass to fat mass will have a higher resting metabolic rate that basically can help them to stay lean and maintain like either a, a neutral or, or negative calorie balance, depending on what they're going for. Um, so that's just to say that the calories in and calories out, although true, isn't necessarily that helpful for people because we can't, I mean, ultimately we could probably control most of those factors, but we can only control them if we have conscious awareness of them. And even then it could be very hard to change some of these factors depending on not as much genetics, but microbiome. If, like we said, we're, if you're exposed to antibiotics at a young age, you're actually crippling your microbiome, um, potentially indefinitely, but now at least there's some prebiotic and other strategies we can use to optimize the microbiome as adults. Um, but just, you know, through diet alone may actually not be enough to create the large shifts in the microbiome that we need to kind of restore healthy balance that would have been achieved if we didn't have this early antibiotic exposure. Um, and we know, for example, early antibiotic exposure or not being breastfed as a child sets individuals up for a higher risk of inflammatory issues such as asthma, autoimmunity, um, IBS, IBD, and also like even psychological issues like anxiety and depression. So, you know, I think now at least as the, this next generation comes up with this information hopefully available to them, we can be more mindful about administering antibiotics to our children. But for those people who did have these exposures as kids, we can now think more about strategies to optimize the microbiome as adults to help mitigate and prevent the development of these diseases.
if fat loss is the goal, someone should 100% focus on their gut health. Absolutely. And like yeah. in my practice, I, I always make sure that somebody's digestion and elimination and microbiome are optimized before we enter like a caloric deficit and try really pushing for fat loss. Just because it's going to make everything in our life easier. It's not as much of an uphill battle if we have the microbiome working on our side with regards to like an energy extraction perspective, with regards to a thermogenesis perspective, and also just like a digestion and elimination perspective. Because, of course, if you're constipated or you're not having a bowel movement daily, the longer you have food sitting around in your gut, the more energy you're going to extract from it and the more bacteria are going to ferment that food matter that's traversing the GI tract. And so ultimately, the more energy you will extract from that, which will contribute to calorie balance, even if it's even if it's a nominal amount, it adds up over time. And it's really kind of hard to account for as well. One thing we didn't even mention is like food labels. There's quite a bit of variability on error on those labels, too. So you can't even just use like uh, like a nutrition facts to calculate your calories in calories out because there can be up to like a 10 percent variability in what's actually there. So it's really hard to account for all these factors. So ideally, we're going to be optimizing our satiety control and those pathways, moving our bodies, getting great sleep, being hydrated, really nailing all of the foundations in order to allow our bodies to self-regulate and it will just make us make our lives so much more easy when we're thinking about trying to lose fat um, and also not get stuck in like a sympathetic state either because that's kind of a whole other can of worms. But Basically, if you're in a caloric deficit, it's going to trigger somewhat of a stress response because, you know, in nature, um, if we're, we're in a caloric deficit, it means we need to go find more food, like we have a potential survival issue on our hands. Um, and that also makes fat more stubborn to come off. Um, so if we can kind of really get our nervous systems regulated as well, this will be a super important step in successful long-term weight loss. You mentioned satiety signals. If someone is not getting that signal... What would you recommend or what's the first thing that comes to mind? Because I, I had a woman inside Thyroid Strong and we were talking about protein and optimal protein targets per meal. And, you know, I was asking like, oh, are you getting, you know, minimum 30 grams of protein per meal? And she said, yes. And I go, and you're still not full. You know, have you tried uh, more protein? You know, maybe it's maybe you need up to 50 grams. And she's like, yeah, but I still am, quote unquote, hungry. And I was like, well, are you actually hungry? Like your stomach is hungry or is it more of a mental hunger? Maybe she's not getting that satiety signal that she needs to stop eating. Mm -hmm, totally. So important to mention that both carbohydrates and protein have a very strong effect on the secretion of things like GLP-1. And so a lot of times, you know, I think low carb diets, we tend to have better control over our eating. Like we don't have these big swings in blood sugar that are driving insulin responses that can drive more hunger and like more eating of carbohydrates specifically. But on the flip side of that, we also know that carbohydrate restriction is associated with like a decline in thyroid hormone production in the long term. So like ketogenic diets, not great for anybody with thyroid issues. Um, but in addition to that, if we really want to kind of um, optimize our satiety signaling pathways, a combination of ideally resistant starches. So let me talk briefly about what, what that is. So resistant starches are starches that are basically chemically modified to prevent them from being digested by our own human enzymes. And what happens is they then spill over into the lower GI where they feed a really key group of bacteria called bifidobacteria. Um, and bifidobacteria is one of the bacteria I'm leveraging all the time in my practice for gut microbiome optimization. Um, so, but in addition to resistant starches feeding these key bacteria, resistant starches are also kind of a form of uh, time-release carbohydrates. So we're really getting like a, just a trickle of glucose from them. And we're not going to get this big burst of sugar that's going to like elevate our blood sugar levels and put us on this glucose roller coaster of like varying energy levels throughout the day. So the resistant starches are really great for stimulating GLP-1 release and the basically the activation of this satiety signaling pathway. And in, in addition to that, protein is also incredibly good at stimulating these satiety signals as well. And so if you combine them together, you can really pack a punch when it comes to feeling satisfied from meals. And so like one easy way to do that would be to have like steak and a cooked and cooled baked potato. So we can basically make resistant starches from like rice or potatoes or beans um, by essentially cooking them and then cooling them down. And then specifically with white rice, if you cook the white rice with a fat source and then cool it down, 
that boosts the resistance starch content even more. And in the case of a potato, like if you make a big potato, mash some butter or sour cream into it and then cool it down, that's also going to facilitate the formation of resistance starch. So these are actually foods that people typically enjoy eating anyway, and we can just do these small hacks to improve their effect on your glycemia, so reduce glycemic load, also feed the microbiome, and stimulate these satiety pathways. So eating something like a ground meat with, a, with rice or a cool, cooking cook, cook cool baked potato with, with steak, these would be very satisfying meals from a biochemical standpoint that typically people also would enjoy eating. So it's kind of a win-win in that case. Um, so sometimes um, you'll see if people don't feel satisfied for meals, they could not be eating enough. They could also be consuming too many processed foods. So like I mentioned earlier, the processed foods are really engineered to put on all the bells and whistles in our brains to tell us to keep eating. And so if anybody has trouble with their weight, with appetite regulation, typically the first thing I do is just just pull them all out. It doesn't have to be a permanent thing. And it doesn't like you can have a little bit here and there, but they shouldn't be a foundation within your diet. You should be eating things that are either, you know, plants or animals that are like minimally processed, that there's not a lot of BS going on. You kind of know what you're eating because um, these foods tend to be higher in protein and or fiber so that these these are kind of like bulk that can help fill the gut and help you feel more satisfied for meals because there's also the aspect of uh, gastric distension. So when your stomach begins to fill, that also triggers satiety to the brain. So if we can eat, you know, more bulk matter that's not as calorically dense, like lean meats and then non-starchy vegetables in combination with some resistant starches, that can be a, a real game changer when it comes to kind of optimizing your satiety for meals. Yeah. Do we have to eat the rice cold or can we heat it back up? Good question. So with regards to the resistant starch, you're going to get the most when it's still cold. But if you cook and cool the rice with, with butter, for example, and then you heat it back up, you can still retain up to 50% of that resistant starch. So I would say if you're going to heat it back up, maybe just have a slightly smaller portion um, and you're still going to reap a lot of benefits from that. And same, same for the potato as well. For the beans, I would recommend eating them cold only. Like hummus is great for resistant starch, but also just like you can just eat beans cold, like a bean salad or just like a side of beans or chickpeas um, because you can't really get fats to absorb very well into those because they're, uh, they have this like fiber protein matrix. So eating the beans cold is the best way to get the resistant starch from those. And then one other food that you can incorporate for resistant starch is semi-green or green bananas. Um, people will probably know if you've tried to eat a banana that's like too green, it's super starchy and it like leaves this film on your mouth and tongue. But you want, if you get it just slightly more ripe than that, it has like a, it's like a yellow with like a greenish glow to it. That's like the perfect ripeness to get resistant starch with it also tasting good and having like a, a pleasing, a pleasing texture. So those would be some great food choices for um, resistant starches. Yes. What tools do we have that are available to us? Because I'm sure the women are like, how do I heal my gut? To, to modulate the microbiome in a very targeted way? Great question. So in my practice, I have a gut protocol that I use with the vast majority of my clients, and I also use it myself. Um, and it's comprised of three primary ingredients. The first one is something called human milk oligosaccharides, so also known as HMOs. These HMOs were initially identified within human breast milk, and their role is to really feed and establish the microbiome in the infant gut. And specifically, these HMOs feed bifidobacteria, and they're such a potent food source that um, you can basically see if you sequence the infant gut microbiome, the microbiome is composed of upwards of 90% or more bifidobacteria. So HMOs are a super potent bifido food source. Um, bifidobacteria is actually responsible for establishing immunity in the infant gut. Um, there's a lot of training that the microbiome has to do with immune cells that surround the gut to essentially tell these immune cells that, you know, we're the good guys, you don't want to kill us, um, and also helping the immune system to be sensitized to the more like pathogens or other things that shouldn't be entering into the body so that the immune system knows what to target and what not to target. Um, so when, you know, when babies aren't breastfed or there's antibiotics involved, you're missing out on this whole training mechanism that's establishing immunity for the rest of the life of, of a child's life. So extremely important. Um, HMOs are really at the forefront of establishing this, this connection with the, with the gut and the immune system. And as adults, we can now leverage this by actually consuming HMO supplements that are now available. 
So specifically, there's one predominant HMO within breast milk that's called 2-Ficosal Lactose or 2-FL. And this is a primary product that's available on the market. It's all. It's also typically in uh, modern infant formulas. You'll see um, 2-FL and also another HMO, which is called LNNT. Um, but in addition to that, there's even additional HMOs that are now being studied. There's actually over 200 different HMOs cur currently characterized in breast milk. Um, but in addition to those two that are that have been on the market for probably the past eight to 10 years. Um, there's additional ones also coming to the forefront that are now also available in supplement form, at least from the one com So the one company that I collaborate with quite a bit is Layer Origin, and they make a 2FL product, but they also make this super HMO blend now that has five different HMOs in it. And three of those HMOs are a special type of HMO that stimulates specific strains of bifidobacteria in the gut that are really important for establishing a healthy gut brain axis and controlling things like anxiety, depression, eating behavior, overall mood. Um, so HMOs are really potent for not only immunity and optimizing the microbiome and optimizing digestion and gut health, but also for mental health and psychological health. So the HMOs are really potent and, and at the forefront of the gut protocol that I use. The second ingredient is a red fruit powder. So Red polyphenols, which are these pigments that are present in fruits and vegetables, um, are a really good food source for bifidobacteria as well. And so, you know, you can also prioritize eating red polyphenols by eating blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, um, beets, red cabbage. Basically, anything that has this like bright purple or red pigment is going to be enriched in these polyphenols that are a great um, food source and prebiotic for bifidobacteria. And then the third ingredient is an apple peel powder. Apple peels, specifically red apple peels, contain a specific molecule called procyanidin. Uh, specifically, there's a, a molecule called C3G that's present in them that is a particularly good food source for acromantia, which lives in our mucus layer and is really helping to um, minimize or modulate gut permeability in a positive way. It's also helping us to maintain healthy weight more easily and, and establishing better glycemic control. So the apple peels ingredient is really targeted towards acromantia and optimizing these bacteria. And also worth noting that this gut, gut protocol was derived from um, Joel Green's book, The Immunity Code. He's a good friend of mine and really is the book that got me super excited about um, the, the modularity or like the ability to optimize the gut microbiome and thinking about it in a way that's like very actionable. And so super, you know, thankful for that, that book and the protocols therein. But this is one of the most potent ones that I've experienced and used with clients. Um, and in particular, it may be worth mentioning. So rewind to when I was telling you guys about how I, I cut out dairy for four years. Well, I eat dairy all the time now. Um, but essentially, I, I cut it out. And when I tried to reintroduce it after about four years, I actually had quite a strong allergic response to it, like, to the point where I had some airway inflammation and I would feel like hot tingly all over my body. So clear histamine response. And typically, you know, what can happen is if you're sensitive or have a mild allergy to a food, if you remove that food for a while, um, you actually sensitize your immune system to that food so that when you reintroduce it, you may have even a stronger response than you did to begin with. And that's pretty common. And typically the way to ameliorate this is to really optimize your gut permeability because if you don't have a hyperpermeable gut, you don't have this quote unquote leaky gut, then you're really not getting the exposure of these immune cells to food antigens to begin with. Um, so if you're digesting your food really well and you're, you're ha not having this hyperpermeability, then those food antigens that could trigger an immune response actually never reach to the immune cells to do that. Um, and so through the gut, optimi uh, gut optimization process and the microbiome optimization process I went through over the course of about a year, I started reintroducing dairy and was completely fine. And then, you know, ever since then, I've basically been fine. And so now I, I'm on the gut protocol. I was on it for like a year straight. And then I'm like kind of on and off it um, at this point. But I, I basically kind of treat it like a food and don't intend to like stay off it for super long periods of time because it's been so beneficial to me. And, uh, and especially with my early antibiotic exposure and everything like that. Um, I just, you know, it's really important for me to make sure my microbiome's optimized through these prebiotics via via diet and or supplementation. Um, so it's just become such an important aspect of my health journey that it just it's kind of a no brainer for me to include it. Um, 
So yeah, that's those are basically the three ingredients of the gut protocol. They're, it's really great for anybody who is struggling with weight loss, uh, struggling with digestive issues, anybody who has a history of a lot of antibiotic use, um, anybody who wasn't breastfed. These would be all contexts within which it's really great. Also, people with food allergies or insensitivities can incorporate this to try to, you know, in an attempt to actually ameliorate these issues. Um, so there's lots of context within which this is a super useful protocol, especially in the modern environment where there's all these insults to our microbiome from, you know, chemical exposures and antibiotic exposure from meats and pesticide residues on vegetables, et cetera. There's a lot of insults to our microbiome that we're encountering even unconsciously. So prioritizing optimization of the microbiome is super important if we're trying to optimize our health. I noticed it's the feeding of the bifidobacteria versus repopulating the bifidobacteria by taking a probiotic. Yes. What's the strategy around that? Great question. So probiotics, I, I, it's kind of a can of worms to me. And like, I, I think because they've become so popular in the mainstream, it's a little bit frustrating from my perspective because most probiotics contain max a couple billion organisms. And the microbiomes controls of, con, con, compose of upwards of 100 trillion bacteria, fungi, protozoa, viruses. And so if you're putting, you know, a couple billion organisms into your body by a pill, that's like adding a drop of water into an ocean. Uh, it's not actually, and on top of that, it's not actually going to make meaningful changes to the microbiome unless we're feeding the right prebiotics to actually allow those bacteria to colonize. So if you're just taking bacteria, but you're not actually eating a diet conducive to that bacteria growing, they're kind of just passing through. They're not going to stick. And so in, in my perspective and my approach is to really take a prebiotic-based approach through diet and supplementation that we're providing the bulk matter needed to actually allow these bacteria to naturally grow and populate versus just, you know, adding a, a drop of these bacteria and hoping that they, they stick. Um, there's definitely a place for probiotics in certain contexts, like post-antibiotic diarrhea. Um, Saccharomyces boulardii is a pretty good approach for that, but that's actually a yeast. That's not even a bacteria. Um, and there's probably certain other contexts within which, which probiotics could work. So like if you want to do a bifidobacteria probiotic in addition to a prebiotic approach, that might not be a bad idea. Um, but there actually was a really interesting study out of Israel in 2018 that essentially looked at a few different cohorts of people and they had taken antibiotics and then they were basically looking to see how quickly the microbiome was repopulated after antibiotic use if people did nothing or if people took a probiotic or if people took a fecal matter transplant. Um, and essentially what they saw was that the individuals who didn't take anything afterwards were able to restore their their microbiome within like three to four weeks max. I think by two weeks, they still had a pretty good uh, recovery. And the individuals who took probiotics, it took them six months to reestablish their starting microbiome. And they ended up doing some mechanistic studies and essentially showing that uh, there's specific bacteria that is present in a lot of probiotics, specifically lactobacilli. So lactobacillus, we consider this a probiotic strain but the thing with lactobacilli is they actually create and secrete molecules that inhibit the growth of other bacteria um, because they're basically trying to, in, in a healthy gut, they're actually going to help inhibit pathogen, pathogen infection and growth. So they're great in that context. But in the microbiome depleted context, what's actually happening is they're preventing the normal repopulation of the gut after antibiotics. And so at the very least, I would not recommend probiotics with lactobacilli in them to somebody who's trying to restore their microbiome. This seems to be a very bad idea um, if we're trying to repopulate and reconstitute the microbiome. Um, I think there's probably a time and place for bifidobacteria probiotics, but I think you're still going to get the biggest differences with a prebiotic-based approach just because the amount of bulk you can get into yourself with regards to prebiotics is so much greater than the amount of bacteria that you can get from a simple probiotic supplement. So the prebiotic approach is superior in my mind, and we see really great benefits using this approach. Um, and then, you know, having said that, there may be certain specific contexts within which using a probiotic may be appropriate. Someone struggling with bloating when they do take a prebiotic, what are some ways to mitigate that bloat? Great question. I love this question. So typically what happens is if you consume a prebiotic, um, 
you get this uptick in the production of these molecules called short chain fatty acids. And these molecules are super important for um, feeding the cells of the gut lining. So colon cells are basically reliant on butyrate, which is one of the short chain fatty acids, to produce energy. It's their favorite food source. If the gut is inflamed in any way, what happens is that the transporters that are responsible for taking up these short chain fatty acids and allowing them to exert their benefits are down regulated. So instead of getting, you know, these short chain fatty acids transported into cells to get so they can do all their great things. Instead, what happens is these short chain fatty acids begin accumulating in the lumen of the gut. And this is why, when you get bloating and gassiness. And so typically, if anybody tip, well, well, like if anybody comes to me and they're experiencing bloating or gas in response to eating raw vegetables or other prebiotics, the first thing that I'll do is an anti-inflammatory protocol for one to two weeks to basically spin down that inflammation to a point where we can now take up those short-chain fatty acids. And then those short-chain fatty acids can then push things in a feed-forward mechanism into a more anti-inflammatory state. Because just briefly, butyrate is really important for modulating the immune cells as well, and it helps to push them into a more anti-inflammatory state. And butyrate is also really important for modulating gene expression in colon cells to help increase the integrity of the tight junctions that regulate gut permeability. Um, and so if we can get that butyrate into cells by at least transiently lowering inflammation, then we can begin to push everything into a more anti-inflammatory direction. So typically in the anti-inflammatory protocol, I'm using a nice high quality omega-3 product, high dose. I'm using molecular hydrogen. I'm using reds powder. So the red fruits, in addition to being a prebiotic, they're also directly antioxidants themselves. So they can help to quench inflammation and feed the bacteria we want around. So they're great in this context as well. Um, and then I'm also using something called hesperidin, which is a citrus polyphenol, citrus flavonoid that's been shown to be really effective at reducing colitis in humans. And so we can combine these things together into like a one to two week protocol um, to basically help to bring inflammation down, levels down acutely, at least acutely, and then introduce small amounts of the HMOs and the apple peels, and then like eventually ramp up to the full dose. And then if it's tolerated, that means that, you know, we're basically good to go. Um, we're kind of pushed in the right direction and we can have this like momentum moving in the anti-inflammatory direction. And if we still get bloating, then we can kind of backtrack and extend the anti-inflammatory protocol for a bit longer. Um, depending on the severity of somebody's issues, I may also incorporate a liquid diet for the first few days. Um, just because, you know, if anybody has digestion issues, that's we're basically by feeding them a liquid diet, we're like pre-chewing and pre-digesting their food to a certain extent. So things like bone broth, um, blended soups, smoothies, um, these would be uh, great options if somebody does have more severe inflammation and needs to do a liquid diet for like one to five days, depending on the severity. And also incorporating things like digestive enzymes if needed um, to help kind of facilitate this process as well. Sometimes, you know, if the digestive tract has kind of been um, compromised for many years, it's important to just kind of give our body a foothold to extract optimal nutrition from food. And um, we can do this by kind of leveraging things like the digestive enzymes and, and also making sure that we're chewing our food really well if we are eating food. So super underrated and actually in the health optimization boot camp um, that I launched a couple months ago, I have a whole, like my first lesson is all on GI health. And there's a lot of conversation about gut health, but I really like to look at things as GI health because What's happening in your mouth is affecting what's happening in your colon. What's happening in your stomach is affecting what's everything downstream. Small intestine, same. So we really need to consider the whole GI tract in order to optimize like the gut, which typically people are referring to the colon when they say the gut. And so we really need to be chewing our food well. There's a really interesting study actually out of Maastricht University in the Netherlands where they showed that um, ground meat compared to whole cuts of meat, ground meat amino acids are rapidly assimilated and incorporated into skeletal muscle. Um, to a much larger extent than steak, at least in middle to elderly aged individuals, which may have dental issues, et cetera, that's preventing them from chewing their food properly. So if somebody does have dental issues or isn't able to, you know, thoroughly chew their food, chew their food for whatever reason, prioritizing ground meats can be one way to make sure that you're optimizing getting the amino acids out of your protein source and also not allowing that amino acid spillover to reach to the colon. Um, this is kind of a whole other can of worms as well, but 
essentially, if we get a lot of protein spillover into the colon, what happens is pH begins to elevate and a healthy colon has a low pH, a low acidic and low oxygen condition. And when protein starts spilling over, we get growth of these bacteria that ferment nitrogen uh, and amino acids to make these nitrogen metabolites that increase pH that ultimately can basically put us on this um, track towards more inflammation, more gut permeability, dysbiosis. Um, so we really want to minimize the amount of protein spilling over into the lower GI. And we can accomplish that by making sure that our food is chewed super well. Or if you can't do that, prioritizing ground meats. Those would be like the two main um, ways to ensure that that doesn't happen. Can someone implement the anti-inflammatory protocol and then the gut optimization protocol if they are still getting some sort of environmental onslaught? Like let's say someone is living in a water damaged moldy home or maybe someone has like an underlying H. pylori infection or SIBO. Will doing the anti-inflammatory protocol and then the gut optimization protocol, will it still have positive effects or should someone wait? Yeah, good question. So I would say overall, you're still going to be building a bit of resilience in your, your microbiome by using these protocols, even if you're in the midst of some other environmental or internal crises. Um, specifically with SIBO, these prebiotics aren't really going to be feeding the bacteria that tend to become overgrown in SIBO. These could either be methane producers or also nitrogen and oxygen metabolizers. So these are a group of bacteria called facultative anaerobes that typically live in the small intestine, but can become overgrown, especially if we have poor digestion. So the more nutrients spill down the digestive tract and aren't absorbed by us, the more we're feeding bacteria to grow there. Um, and so really optimizing what's happening in the mouth with regards to like chewing and making sure we don't have excessive dry mouth from stress, stimulant use, mouth breathing. Um, saliva is a really important aspect of the digestive system and homogenizing food. So that's super important. And then at the level of the stomach, making sure like also stress, um, overuse of stimulants is going to inhibit basically any sympathetic action is going to inhibit acid release into the stomach lining, which is absolutely vital for digesting protein and helping to prepare that food to be assimilated within the small intestine. Um, so super important if we have SIBO or anything going on like that or fungal overgrowth in the small intestine that we're basically maximizing the amount of nutrition we're getting from our food to starve out any organisms that would overgrow by, by consuming those spilling over nutrients. Um, with regards to H. pylori, uh, super interesting. I was actually reading some papers on it yesterday for an ebook I'm writing with with Gabrielle um, Lyon, which is, it should be out actually pretty soon, which it's all in gut health. So that'll be super interesting, I think, for you and your listeners. Um, but essentially, H. pylori is present in up to 50% or more of the population, and it's typically latent, uh, not causing any effects. Um, and actually, H. pylori, individuals with fiber, H. pylori are actually protected against some inflammatory issues, surprisingly. So children that have H. pylori um, have lower incidence of childhood asthma and also inflammatory bowel issues at the lower end of the GI, which is interesting um, because I think we will often hear about the negatives, but not, we don't necessarily hear about the potential positive aspects of this bug. Um, but essentially, these, these bacteria are able to, in, in a stressed out body that's not regulating itself very well, they burrow, can burrow into the stomach lining and create an inflammatory environment within the stomach that can make people prone to peptic ulcers and also set people up for potentially having gastric cancers like way down the line. Um, and so I think from an H. pylori perspective, if you're getting active symptoms from that, it's really important to kind of monitor what's going on in our lives that's allowing our body to be in that compromised state to begin with. So like, how are we managing our stress? How is our sleep quality? Um, are we like over consuming or abusing stimulants of any sort that are going to push us into a more sympathetic state and inhibit our ability to digest food properly? Um, so really when it comes to things related to the stomach and also the mouth, it typically boils down to a nervous system regulation issue. Um, but in addition to that, and importantly, if we don't have a proper bite in our mouth, so if our teeth aren't meeting properly, that can also stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and create issues. Or if we are potentially snoring or mouth breathing during sleep and we don't know about it, that's also setting us up for having a hypersympathetic state throughout the day and we're not getting that rest or recovery during sleep. 
Um, so there's certain things like we can do, like using mouse tape, for example, during sleep can kind of be a somewhat temporary fix or potentially a long-term fix. So I think most people mouth breathe during sleep because there's some underlying issue going on. So like for me, I definitely have had some issues with that in the past. And I think I have very large tonsils and like my doctors always remarked when I was a kid about how large they are and they always wanted to take them out. Um, and I didn't have insurance as a kid, thankfully, I think, because who knows how many organs I'd be missing if I did. But um, I still have them. And I think, you know, I, I've done some reading and has show, it, there's basically literature that shows that if you have enlarged tonsils, it can create a tongue thrust, which basically pushes the tongue posture forward in the mouth. That can create an open bite, which I do have a slight open bite. And in addition to that, could create some level of obstruction in the breathing uh, mechanics. So at times, like you may have to find the right sleeping position for you in order to mitigate mouth breathing during sleep. But for me, using the mouth tape has been super helpful. And I've seen my HRV go up since using it during sleep. So that's kind of hinting that things are potentially working. And then it's just a matter of training the mouth to stay shut and then also making sure that we're in sleeping positions that allow us to breathe um, well during sleep. And so for a lot of people, like if you're using too many pillows under your head, for example, and it's pushing your neck up, it's kind of that's restricting your airway the further forward your head posture is. So it's super important to make sure we're, you know, we're breathing properly and absolutely no mouth breathing during the day. Like we should not be. Uh, if anybody has that level of nasal obstruction that's preventing them from breathing through their nose, they can use things like breathe right strips. Or if, you know, they had a broken nose or something like that, like then potentially surgical options would be the way to clear and open the airway of the nose. Um, but it would really be on a, like a case by case basis of, you know, what's going on and how it can be dealt with. But but yeah, when it comes to like the upper GI tract, nervous system regulation is key. And there's lots of different factors that can kind of play into that. Yeah. When you're working with clients, what is kind of the order of operation? Because I think a lot of women, especially with an autoimmune condition, will do an elimination diet first or they do an autoimmune paleo protocol. And then maybe they don't do the reintroduction phase. And next thing you know, they're on like three different foods five years later and probably on the borderline of like a eating disorder. What is kind of the order of operation? Is there an element of you're seeing an elimination diet with a reintroduction, then an anti-inflammatory protocol, then a gut optimization protocol? Yeah, great question. So um, if God depends somewhat on a case by case basis and what people are coming to me with symptom wise um, or goal wise, but First and foremost, if we ever restrict any type of food, like the ultimate goal is to get somebody to a point where they can eat whatever they want and they're not going to have issues with it. Um, so any sort of dietary restriction is always like a short to moderate term approach for me. Um, for a standard elimination diet, if somebody's having like a lot of gastric issues and they don't really pay attention to what they're eating, like, you know, they're eating lots of different things that could be causing issues and they just don't know, then I think in that case, doing an elimination diet is typically helpful. Um, and we typically, typically will remove all the major allergens first, like eggs, soy, wheat, milk, um, gluten in general. So those would be kind of the, some of the main ones first that we're eliminating for at least two to four weeks. And then we're going to add each one back independently for a period of time of, you know, between four weeks, four days to a week um, to see, you know, if there's any response. If there's no negative response, then we're basically going to add back the next food. And so the goal is to basically restrict the minimum amount possible to facilitate the healing process and like support the body during that time and then ultimately reintroduce the food. And bifidobacteria is super important, actually, because if you increase bifidobacteria, you're basically going to train your digestive tract to be able to digest, especially the dairy proteins and dairy sugars. Um, so even people who are lactose intolerant, if they optimize their microbiome, can like in a, in a lot of cases eat dairy again without any issues. Um, so that's important to note. So even things that people think that they, they can't eat, you know, ever again is not necessarily the case. Um, so the order of operations, I would say for like a standard, like a typical client coming to me would be we're assessing whether they have inflammation in their gut first and foremost before we do the full on gut protocol. Um, and one way to do that is like if they don't get any bloating or gas from eating like raw vegetables, that's, that's definitely a hint that there may not be that big of an issue with regards to inflammation. But one major test is literally just having them try the HMO powder. And if they get bloating or gas from it, that's going to signal like, okay, we'll just take a step back and we'll do an anti-inflammatory protocol for one to two weeks. And then we'll start reintroducing the HMOs because they're such a potent food source for bifidobacteria 
and stimulator of short chain fatty acid production, um, we can basically see if they get a response to those HMOs, that's going to be indicating that there's, there's some inflama inflammation fomenting within the colon. Um, and then, you know, once that side effect or symptom is resolved throughout like the course of a, depending on like the person, it could be one week of anti-inflammatory protocol up to three weeks, potentially. We may need to incorporate a liquid diet at some point in there if they have really serious issues. Ultimately, then we get them on the gut protocol. And I like people to stay on it for like four weeks um, at least. And then like depending on their issues and their goals, if they're trying to enter a fat loss phase and, and, and begin a weight loss process, then typically I'll have them stay on that protocol throughout the duration of that process just to kind of help make it less of an uphill battle um, from an appetite regulation and energy um, homeostasis perspective. And then, you know, depending on what somebody's got going on, then we'll start optimizing other areas of health because I really consider the GI tract and the gut to be foundational when it comes to health. We typically always will start there to make sure everything is looking good and feeling good. And then we can move up to higher levels where it's like whether we want to optimize cognition, whether we want to optimize performance, whether we need to work on sleep or, um, you know, basically basically anything that you could think of that somebody might have a goal related to, those will all be the secondary phase versus the gut is, and then and the GI optimization is going to come first. And then we'll move on to these more higher level um, goals that somebody might have. Um, so that's kind of how the process works when I'm seeing a client. I'm going to pivot. Last question. If someone follows you on Instagram, which everyone should, they might see an Instagram story of you on a bike trainer in front of red lights. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> doing zone two training. And so we talk a lot about resistance training, maintaining your muscle mass, prioritizing protein in terms of fat loss goals. But can you just speak to zone two training and then also why behind red light therapy? Yeah, I would love to. So zone two is a, an interesting area of aerobic training that's basically maximizing your body's ability to burn fat. Um, so essentially, you're working at like your top aerobic capacity. So aerobic means that you're using oxygen to generate energy and fat and, and ketones to a certain extent as well are the primary substrates for energy production in an aerobic setting. And so zone two training is really optimizing for aerobic energy metabolism, which happens in the mitochondria. So it's a great modality of exercise to optimize mitochondrial density, um, fat burning capacity, and overall, like increase the number and the size of the mitochondria that you have. And so basically the zone two training, you know, personally, I do it typically between 45 minutes to an hour. Um, a lot of times I'll do it. I do it in the winter pretty frequently, maybe like three to five days a week. But in the summer and the spring, typically I'm doing more lifting. I'm doing more work outside, like just enjoying being in, in nature. And so like running or lifting outside or doing sprints biking, things like this. Um, but for the zone two training, it's great to get one or two sessions a week um, to really optimize the, the aerobic capacity and the mitochondrial health um, versus strength training, which is really optimizing for growth and glycolytic anaerobic metabolism. So that means that when you're lifting and you're doing like, you know, a set that's near failure or lifting heavy weights, you're relying mostly on anaerobic or non-oxygen dependent energy metabolism, which is dependent on burning glucose and also um, cycling through creatine and creatine phosphate to produce ATP, which is the primary cellular energy source. Um, so the, the lifting and the aerobic training are kind of on opposite ends of a spectrum where we actually want to train both so that we have the capacity to do both very well. Um, and it just makes us like more metabolically flexible too, because if we can burn fat really well and we can burn carbs really well, that means that we're metabolically flexible versus just kind of being locked in one end or the other. Um, and so the zone two training couples really well with red light therapy because, and the red light panel that I have is from MitoRad, it's like an NIR and red light panel. And essentially NIR and red light, they synergize pretty well, but, but both of them will stimulate mitochondria to help promote mitochondrial energy production, help to decrease inflammation and promote circulation. It also is really good for the skin and like promoting collagen production and like um, promoting elasticity. But essentially, I like to do the red light and NIR therapy with the zone two because they're both working on the mitochondria to help optimize mitochondrial health 
and density. And so together they can synergize really nicely to, to work on the same pathways. Um, so I'm on my bike, I tend to put the light panel behind me. And so I have it, I usually wear like shorts and like a, like a sports bra so that most of my skin is exposed. And then um, that, that light, the NIR and the red can kind of penetrate and, and help to kind of get me to, to the goal of mitochondrial optimization a little bit quicker than I could get with either alone. Yeah. And it has to be pretty close, the red light panel to your skin. Yeah. Yeah. So I usually have it like right behind my back and you can actually feel the heat. Like if you're, if, if it's a proper, a appropriate distance, you'll feel like the heat from the NIR, which actually vibrates your cells to generate heat in your body. So it's pretty cool. Actually, if you touch the panel, it's cool to the touch, but you'll feel like your body heating up and sweating um, significantly from that NIR radiation that's vibrating your cells and helping to generate this heat. And it actually makes you feel like you got an even better workout because your body does get quite hot and you start sweating way more than you would with just the, the zone two training alone. Yeah. Alexis, you're such a wealth of knowledge and information. Thank you so much for sharing with our listeners. Where can people find you? Thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. You asked amazing questions. So it was, it was kind of effortless. Um, people can find me primarily on Instagram at Dr. Alexis Jasmine. Jasmine spelled like J-A-Z-M-Y-N. And then that's where I'm posting a lot in my stories. I do some posts on my, my page as well, but I'm super active in my stories. I also have highlight reels of a lot of my previous stories with regards to meal prep and recipes and also exercise and some other health optimization tips. So people can find information there. They can reach out to me by DMs. And I also, um, if people don't have an Instagram and they want to contact me by email, my email is dralexisjasmine at gmail.com. So those would be the two primary ways to reach me. Yeah. And you also have a great boot camp. I took it, Health Optimization Boot Camp. It was super informative and super fun. Um, are you currently offering that or going to offer it in the future? Yeah, thank you for asking. So I have the bootcamp bundle available for sale. It's the, basically all the recordings and all the course materials and slides. So anybody who wants to have that offering, they can they can just go to the link in my bio on my page and there's a link there to purchase it and you'll get access to everything up front so you can go through it at your own pace. The Slack room is still open. So any questions that somebody has as they're going through the program, they can ask in the Slack and then I can get back to answer their question there. Um, there's lots of good information on the Slack. I also put most of my protocols within this program. So a lot of the protocols that I use with my clients and my practice are available as part of the health optimization bootcamp bundle. Um, so yep, people can purchase that on my link in bio. And in addition to that, I'm also finishing up another course, which is the scientific literacy intensive. And basically this, this is to help people navigate the very complex information landscape that we live in today. Um, to help them, you know, read literature effectively and efficiently and be able to come to their own conclusions about different topics related to, you know, their health and, and health optimization or, you know, different topics that are available today. And I think it's always best, like, it's good to find experts that you trust that you can kind of defer to. But ideally, we're able to vet information ourselves so that we don't have to rely on other people and like kind of just believe in something instead of actually understanding facts from fiction. So that's really the goal of this course. And that's also available for purchase. Um, the last class is on this Friday, but it's going to be bundled together as well and available as like the set of recordings. And the link for that is also in my bio. So those are the two main offerings that I have available right now. Um, there'll probably be more to come this year. We'll see um, what's cooking. I, I kind of don't really plan much. I just kind of see what feels right. And then I'll like launch things randomly. So I'm sure there'll be more to offer. Just uh, stay tuned. You can follow me on Instagram and I'll, you know, post any sort of ideas or upcoming offers that are coming your guys' way. Yeah. Well, I can speak for personal experience. Both those courses are great because I've taken both. Same. Looking forward to Friday's call. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Alexis, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you on. This was awesome. Thank you so much. We should do it again sometime. Um, and yeah, this this was great. Thank you. For sure.